Good morning or afternoon depending on where you are joining us from. And welcome to the informational webinar for Evidence for Action, Investigator Initiated Research to Build a Culture of Health. Evidence for Action is a national program of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation based at the Center for Health and Community at the University of California, San Francisco. I'm Erin Hagen, Deputy Director for Evidence for Action, and I'll be your moderator today. During the webinar, our speakers will provide an overview of the program, describe the call for proposals including the grant application process, and answer questions from you, the audience. We've already received some questions from participants through the registration process. So if you sent us questions in that way, you don't have to resubmit them through the chat feature. But for all other questions, please do submit them through the chat feature on your screen. We'll try to address as many questions as possible at the end of the presentation. We have a lot to cover today, so let's get right into it. I'd like to start by asking each of the speakers to introduce themselves, starting with our program officer at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Hi everyone, I'm Claire Gibbons, Senior Program Officer at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Hello, I'm Nancy Adler. I am co-director of the Evidence for Action program. And I'm David Blahov, and I am the Evidence for Action co-director with Nancy. And I'm Maria Greemore, and I'm the Evidence for Action Associate Director. And I'm Laura Gottlieb, Evidence for Action Associate Director. Thanks, everyone. Claire, why don't you start by giving everyone a bit of a background about the Foundation's Culture of Health vision. Thanks, Erin. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm so pleased to be joining you today along with my colleagues at UCSF as we launch this new research program. So for more than 40 years, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation has worked with people across the country to address major health and healthcare issues of our time. From its beginning, RWDF's work has been driven by rigorous research, evaluation, and learning. But despite the work of RWDF and many, many others around the country, our health can be unduly and unequally influenced by income, education, ethnicity, and where a person lives. We also have a very expensive and disjointed system of healthcare that does not systematically extend beyond the walls of medical offices to the places where people live, learn, work, and play. So RWDF's new vision, introduced in 2014, is of an America where we all strive together to build a national culture of health, a culture that enables all in our diverse society to lead healthier lives. We envision the culture of health as one in which keeping everyone as healthy as possible is a fundamental and defining health goal and American value where policies ensure people receive health care that's high quality, efficient, and affordable where, when, and how they need it. So with input from partners and colleagues across the country, RWJF has developed a culture of health action framework to mobilize action. The framework is represented by four action areas that you can see on your screen. Making health a shared value, fostering cross-sector collaboration to improve well-being, creating healthier, more equitable communities, and strengthening integration of health services and systems. And together, these action areas are expected to result in improved population health, well-being, and equity. This action framework re reflects a vision of health and well-being as the sum of many parts combining components essential to improving population health and motivating culture change. Its four action areas are intended to focus efforts and mobilize an integrated course of action by many individuals, communities, and organizations. Thanks so much, Claire. That's really helpful context for this work. Now I'd like to ask Nancy to describe how the Evidence for Action program will help support the foundation in building a culture of health. Thanks, Erin. As a national program of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, Evidence for Action is tasked with developing the evidence base needed to build a national culture of health. We'll do this by awarding grants to support innovative, rigorous research to address the gaps in knowledge about the impact of programs, policies, and partnerships on health and well-being, with a particular focus on advancing health equity. We're also interested in exploring novel approaches to measuring health determinants and outcomes. 
This is an investigator-initiated program, which means that we haven't defined specific research questions to be addressed. Rather, we're looking to the field to generate ideas about the most pressing, timely, and informative research. So research funded through Evidence for Action will better, help better explain the underlying construct of the components of the action framework that Claire described, as well as the interactions among the action areas. The action model is visionary and helps to point, pinpoint areas where empirical validation is needed, but many questions remain about the critical components, how they work together to improve health and well-being, and how they can be modified. Building a culture of health will require understanding how non-health programs and policies impact health outcomes. We know that many relevant policies and programs cross sectors, and we strongly encourage applications from multi-sector research teams. The research results that are generated through the program should help guide effective actions to improve population health and health equity. Thanks, Nancy. I'll take a minute now to go over some of the high-level details about our grants. I also want to reassure people that this entire presentation, both audio and visual, will be archived on our website after the presentation and remind you to keep chatting in your questions as we go along. So the program is initially authorized for three years. In the first year, we anticipate awarding about $2.2 million in funding. We aren't setting a specific dollar amount per grant, but we expect to award somewhere between 5 and 12 grants per year. We expect to have a research portfolio that includes studies of various sizes and costs, and in evaluating applications, we will focus on the importance and quality of the proposed project. The budget will be secondary, and we trust that applicants will ask for what is realistically needed to accomplish the proposed research. Given limited funds, we will need to factor in the opportunity cost of funding larger projects in relation to those with smaller budgets. Grant periods will likely vary, but we plan on no more than 30-month periods. And again, in the application process, we'll ask researchers to let us know how long they need to conduct their proposed study. Moving on to applicant eligibility, it's pretty straightforward. Applicants must be U.S.-based public entities or nonprofit organizations that are tax-exempt under the 501c3 Internal Revenue Code and not a private foundation or Type 3 supporting organization. This is not just a program for researchers in the health field. We encourage investigators and teams from a variety of sectors and disciplines to apply. For example, we hope to receive applications from cross-sector research teams that include business leaders, community planning experts, architects, economic development professionals, policy advocates, people working in the asset building sector, or with experience in the criminal justice field. The list really could go on. We also hope that community-based organizations and advocacy groups will reach out to academic or professional researchers as partners in this work. As we've mentioned, we're leaving much of this program up to the researchers, from the specific research questions to the funding amount and duration, but we do have some general ideas about the research that might best support the Foundation's vision of building a culture of health. So we'd like to spend the next few minutes going over the themes and approaches that are included in the call for proposals. Nancy, could you tee up the conversation by describing the purpose of the themes and how we arrived at them? Sure, I'd be happy to. And I want to start by stressing that the themes are provided as general guidance to offer context for this work. They are not categories or requirements for funding, and the researchers do not need to designate a theme when they're applying for funding. In the early stages of launching this program, what we did was to convene a working group of researchers representing diverse dis disciplines from around the Bay Area to help us think about how to define the culture of health and to identify areas where empirical evidence is most needed to advance it. The thematic areas emerged as a product of that process, along with extensive conversations with staff at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and our internal team there. There are six thematic areas that are described in the call for proposals. These are advancing health equity, conditions and programs that foster a culture of health in communities, 
creating healthy trajectories across the life course, health system activities that foster a culture of health, measure of components of the action framework, multi-sector partnerships, and trade-offs and unintended consequences. David, Maria, and Laura will now describe each of these themes in more detail. Thanks, Nancy. David, Maria, Laura, we'll turn it over to you to walk us through the themes. David, do you want to start us off? I do. Thank you, Erin. So I'm going to start us off with the theme about advancing health equity. Equity is an overarching component of the entire action framework and should be considered in all domains. The association between social and environmental factors and poor health outcomes among low-income people and people of color is well established. Why this pattern occurs and how it can be changed are questions we're still trying to answer. In addition to considering equity as a component of all studies, we encourage applicants to propose studies that specifically address social and economic inequities and their resultant impact on health outcomes, not just to demonstrate inequities, but to discover the best ways to reduce or eliminate them. Examples of relevant topics might include determining differential uptake or impact of healthy living strategies across social, economic, geographic, racial, or cultural areas or groups. Another example is identifying the most successful techniques and approaches for expanding opportunities for people living in disadvantaged areas. Shifting now to the theme about conditions and programs that foster a culture of health in communities, we know community characteristics can promote or impede good health and well-being. But research is still needed to better understand what characteristics have the greatest impact, and how policies and practices can be formulated and implemented to show equitable and healthy communities. This could include research on the processes by which decisions that impact a culture of health are made, how evidence can best be translated and disseminated in a manner that can inform policy decisions differences or similarities in program implementation and outcomes across multiple settings, or linking measures of civic engagement and social cohesion with health outcomes among diverse populations. A concrete example of relevant research might be identifying successful strategies for embedding health-related community benefits into private development projects. Maria? Thanks, David. Um, so next we talk about the theme focused on creating healthy trajectories across the life course. This theme was really developed based on research suggesting that there may be sensitive or critical periods during which additional resources or supports have disproportionately large health benefits. But there's still quite a bit of uncertainty about these sensitive periods, if and when they occur whether they are best defined based on biological age or other major life events um, or some other criterion. And, and really what determines how a person responds to the stressors, events, or interventions encountered during these sensitive periods. So this theme emphasizes research in addition to exploring those questions um, related to other possible areas might include creative strategies to align the needs of individuals at different points in the life course so that the same policies benefit all groups of people, or research on how to provide useful evidence to help policymakers balance investments with different payoffs over time, just as examples of possible research questions. I'm going to turn it over now to Laura to talk about the next theme. Thanks, Maria. So this theme is called Health System Activities that Foster a Culture of Health. This theme is related to the roles and activities that healthcare systems will need to take on to contribute to building a culture of health. We're specifically interested in how those new roles can help integrate healthcare with other sectors to improve health and well-being. This theme includes healthcare system activities focused on value, access, and cost, as well as those activities that increase the capacity of healthcare providers to work effectively across delivery systems, 
to share data that can improve population health efforts, and to bridge healthcare with social care sectors. There is a need to more rigorously study the connections between interventions in healthcare settings that target upstream determinants and individual and community health outcomes, and to evaluate these interventions using metrics for return on investment that could support scaling successful strategies. Some examples of research in this theme could include evaluating projects in which healthcare systems link patients with services that address social and behavioral determinants of health, like prescriptions for housing or food, evaluating the health impacts of actual healthcare system investments in upstream interventions, like supportive housing or on-site food distribution programs, and comparing both approaches to and impacts of community benefits needs assessments and other community benefits investments. Back to you, Maria. Thank you, Laura. Um, so now we'll talk about the theme focused on measurements of components of the action framework. So in addition to our traditional models and methods, we need new measures and metrics to better understand and track the ideas represented in the culture of health action framework. So this theme, which emphasizes measures of components of the action framework, addresses the need to both develop these measures and adopt innovative research approaches to analyze the components of the framework, the links between these components, how they, how they connect to each other, and the measures of population health and equity. Examples of possible research areas might include work to develop better indicators of population health that are appropriate across the life course and capture a broad vision of physical and mental health and well-being, development of more robust indicators of effective partnerships between health systems and public health, validation of measures of key community characteristics that foster a culture of health, or empirical tests to evaluate whether and how the components of the action framework influence population health and well-being. The multi-sector partnerships theme highlights research on partnerships that are most likely to bring together diverse stakeholders to work in collaboration to invest in and improve population health. Stakeholders will vary and could represent housing, transportation, environment, business or commerce, education, or other sectors. We hope that research under this theme will help provide empirical validation for the impacts of multi-sector partnerships on individual and population health outcomes. Aspects of partnerships that could be studied under this theme include data systems that can improve the continuity of care across diverse systems, defined management structures, and community participation and engagement. Research relevant to this theme could include evaluations of health outcomes of care collaboratives that pool data across multiple agencies, like accountable care communities, as well as the uses and implications of community health needs assessments that are developed through partnerships between healthcare systems and community organizations. Now we're going to talk about trade-offs and unintended consequences. The theme of trade-offs and unintended consequences recognizes that decision makers at all levels have to make choices and set priorities when allocating resources, and that these decisions may have disproportionately positive or negative outcomes for some groups compared to others. The interconnections between resources and health outcomes is complex, and we need better data on the cost and consequences related to the potential range of outcomes in order to more effectively anticipate the impact of decisions across all areas of the action model. For example, research might involve incorporating assessments of health impacts into the evaluation of policy implementation in non-health sectors, such as housing, transportation, or education. Another example, Quantifying the benefits and opportunity costs of prioritizing health versus some other outcome, or of targeting individuals at immediate risk versus the whole population. Third example might be identifying when progress towards improving one health outcome might alter or offset progress towards another. Erin? 
Thank you, David, Maria, and Laura. That was a great overview and has hopefully gotten participants thinking about interesting research ideas. I do want to reiterate, as Nancy stated at the beginning, that applicants do not need to designate a theme when they are applying for a grant, that these themes are intended to provide context for this work. As a reminder, please submit your questions through the chat feature. We will answer as many as we can at the end of the presentation. I see we have been getting a lot of great questions already. But before we turn to the Q&A, I just want to go over the process and criteria we will use for awarding grants. This will be a two-phased process consisting of a two-page letter of intent followed by an invited full proposal. We began accepting LOIs on June 1st and will continue accepting them on a rolling basis throughout the life of the program. We will review our evaluation criteria with you momentarily. Those applicants that are invited to submit full proposals will have two months from the time that they are notified to submit their proposal. We anticipate awarding our first grants sometime this December. The example timeline we have provided here and in the call for proposals represents the earliest possible decision points. I want to stress that these dates do not represent official deadlines. Nancy, could you review the selection criteria we'll use to evaluate the letters of intent and full proposals? Sure. So uh, you know, as Erin uh, mentioned, the letters of intent will be accepted on a rolling basis, and they will be evaluated internally by, by our team in the uh, National Program Office on the basis of uh, three primary criteria. One is the fit with the Foundation's vision for building a culture of health. The second is the importance of the scientific contribution of the study. And the third is the feasibility of conducting the proposed research within the parameters of this program. We'll make decisions to invite full proposals, uh, and this will be done collaboratively between the NPO and our program team at the Foundation. Then moving on in terms of for uh, letters of intent that are invited to send in a full proposal, the full proposals will undergo a more in-depth evaluation process that's both internal and external uh, in terms of inviting external reviewers. These external reviewers will be selected based on their expertise and uh, its relationship to the content of the proposal. In addition to the criteria that we use to assess the LOIs, the full proposal evaluation criteria will include potential to address knowledge gaps and contribution to scientific advancement, the clarity and importance of the research aims, hypothesis, theoretical framework, and conceptual model or rationale, the rigor and innovation of the design or approach for sampling, data collection, and analysis, the evidence that there is adequate access to needed data, settings, and study populations, the specificity and appropriateness of data collection and data analysis, the research qualifications, experience, and, comp and accomplishments of the proposed team, the appropriateness of the disciplines and perspectives represented, and the commitment of the investigators to the project. The, uh, the relevance of the study population will also be evaluated, as will the plan for communicating and disseminating the research results and finally, the appropriateness of the budget and timeline. Erin? Thanks, Nancy. So that concludes our formal presentation about the program and the call for proposals. We have been getting a lot of questions, and I know that we wanted to save time to try to answer as many as possible. So let's get right into those. There are a few um, that, that have come up quite a bit that are relatively logistical. So I want to take a minute to reiterate some of the qualifications we talked about during the presentation. First of all, again, this presentation will be archived on our website at the end of, um, of the presentation and available for you to view going into the future. Additionally, I want to remind people that the themes, as we mentioned, are not criteria for applica applicants to designate during their application process. LOIs are accepted on a rolling basis, meaning that there is not a deadline, but a letter of intent is required. 
and full proposals are invited based on our evaluation of the letter of intent process. So now we'll move towards some of the, I think, bigger questions that we've received from people. One is, how can a small startup or nonprofit with a new approach be as competitive and get their voice heard over the more substantial evidence-based projects that have been around for a while? Nancy, do you want to start us off with that? Sure. Uh, first of all, we would really love to see applications just like this. And the way I think it can happen best is through a partnership. So if you're a young startup or a nonprofit that hasn't done much research, it would be really helpful to partner with a researcher who does bring the skills and expertise to help you do it. It would still come to the organization but would have the adequate research participation to make us comfortable that it's a feasible project. Great. Thank you. So another question that we received, Claire, you might want to speak to um, from the broader vision of the foundation, which is how does access to insurance fit into the vision for a culture of health? Thanks, Erin. Um, that's a great question. Um, you know, we explicitly talk about the integration between health and healthcare in domain or action area four of the action framework. And I think um, you know, there is a tremendous amount of evidence that shows that uh, health insurance coverage is related to health. So I, I think that that is um, something that we would consider and absolutely not rule out. Great. Thank you so much. So David, we've been getting a few questions about how broadly do we define creative and what do we mean by innovative. Can you help people understand what we're trying to look for? Yeah, you know, creative for me, uh, you know, as we were having some conversation about it, I think the idea is not to uh, put ourselves in, in boxes of, you know, traditional thinking. You can think outside the box with what you're coming in with. But uh, you also have to make a case uh, for, for what you're looking at and what you're hoping to get as an outcome. Something that is written in a way that uh, you know, people can read it, review it, uh, get a strong sense of what it is that you're doing and uh, relating that to health outcomes. Great. So, Laura, people are asking about if applicants need to identify their full team within the LOI or if they can suggest where their partnerships might lie and then, and then describe the specific partners in the full proposal if asked. Yeah, I believe we've asked folks to identify the full project team in the letter of intent. That doesn't mean that people couldn't be added uh, in the context of the full proposal, but as best uh, you are able to clarify who the different members of the team are during the LOI process, um, the better we'll be able to evaluate uh, the capacity of the team to conduct the proposed research. Thanks. And to, and to provide some additional clarification for people, through the applicant and review system, you're asked both to identify partnering organizations as well as identifying specific people that might be partners. Um, and in the applicant and review system, we would love to know the organizations in advance that you plan on partnering with, but the specific people um, can be input during the full proposal process. In fact, there's only the capacity for you to input the, the um, primary investigator and potentially one co-investigator during the LOI stage. So another question that we received is about if we would accept applications from rural communities or from the South. Of course, we encourage applications from all over the country. Um, this is a national program and we really want to have um, a well a, a well a well a broad group of applicants and a broad group of grantees if possible. Maria, the next question is is there an advantage to early proposal submission versus later submission? Um, the, the timing should really be driven by when you're prepared to make a very strong proposal and um, clearly state what the 
research agenda is and how important it will be for a culture of health. Um, there's no, it's, it's not as if there's a clear advantage one way or the other. It's really around structuring the strongest possible proposal. Great, thanks. David, we just received a question about how we will measure the research qualifications of the team. Can you talk a little bit more about what we're looking for? It's a, it's a good question. The thing that we look for is uh, does, does the person have uh, experience in, in doing research? You know, is there a track record so that there's evidence of uh, you know, a person having produced uh, research and uh, uh, you know, gotten that disseminated to others. Uh, so that, that for us is a, a primary um, consideration, and, and that is are they uh, experienced? Um, do they have a track record in the particular area that is within their proposal, or do they have a member of their team that's in the, on the proposal that uh, complements uh, to be able to really not just pose the question, but to be able to see it through. Thanks. Nancy, another question we've gotten is, are, will programs that don't demonstrate direct change in healthy behavior be considered for support? Can you talk, to, talk about that just a little bit? Sure. Uh, the brief answer is absolutely they'll be considered. Uh, health behaviors are a really important component of fostering health and, and well-being, but it's not the only uh, pathway, and we, we, we really want to look at the multiple pathways and also some of the upstream factors. So we are most interested in things that can be linked to actual changes in health, and it doesn't have to be those that just go through health behaviors. So again, we would welcome applications focused on health behavior, but would also very much welcome applications that are looking at health outcomes without looking at that particular pathway. Great. So we've gotten a couple um, clarifications about eligibility questions. So one is about criteria of citizenship for the principal investigator. Um, I just want to say that we, we don't award grants to individuals. We only award grants to organizations. Um, and so the organization must be based in the United States, but you could be a principal investigator with citizenship in another country based at a U.S.-based organization and you would be eligible. Um, we also received some questions about the duration um, and how long the grants could be uh, it could be awarded for. So again, we're anticipating 30 months duration, but, but we really are asking researchers when you apply to tell us the amount of time that you need. Um, and so we're not requiring that you spend 30 months. If you need more than 30 months, we encourage you to explain why you need, need that amount of time, um, and we'll be able to consider those requests. But based on the funding amount that we have allocated, we're anticipating not more than 30-month grants and some that might be shorter. Um, there also is another question about, again, where researchers could be based. Is this request for proposals limited to applicants in the Bay Area? Absolutely not. We encourage and hope to get applicants and letters of intent from across the country. Um, and including the territories, the U.S. territories, so we're hoping to have a very diverse applicant pool. Um, and again, some other questions about the average funding amount. We aren't sure exactly what the funding amount will be. We're waiting to see the types of applications we receive and how much money is needed to accomplish those sorts of projects. We're expecting somewhere between 5 to 12 grants over uh, the first year with a total funding allocation of about $2.2 million this year. Um, so another question that, that we have gotten is about um, where the research organization comes from, if the research organization needs to be the lead, or can a nonprofit be the lead agency? Um, Nonprofits can be the lead agency. The principal investigator should be a qualified researcher. 
so we're getting lots of questions in. One of the questions, Maria, maybe you could speak to this a little bit. Are new methodological approaches for assessing um, outcomes, community burden of disease, or health outcomes, new methods or metrics, is that something that we're interested in? This, <coughs> excuse me, this directly relates to our theme around um, improving measures, and we're, we're definitely enthusiastic about receiving proposals that focus on in strengthening measurement, um, innovative research methods. Uh, there was a question specifically about quasi-experimental approaches. Um, and really the, the most important, um, the design is going to depend on where the scientific question is, and um, we will consider uh, research across the spectrum and certainly within the related to measurement of um, health outcomes. Thanks. Nancy, do the proposals have to be an established project that has already demonstrated clear results, or are we interested in pr projects that are in the pilot stage? Actually, we would be real. We'd be interested in both. I mean, we would love to see something that's established, but that is being extended in some way. Uh, but probably even more excited about some some new pilot project that would be possibly has a greater chance of moving the needle. So it, it'll be some combination of how promising and important is the question and how, not, not just how well established it is, but how feasible is it that they could find an answer. Thanks. Claire, do you all have experience at the foundation or do you allow for lead organizations who are not for profit or who are university based to partner with for profit entities? We we'll consider grants that partner with for profit entities, Erin, but as you said earlier, the, the grant is actually going to an organization, and the organization which receives a grant must be a 501c3 tax exempt organization. But we do, um, you know, we expect to see some partnerships with other organizations that may be for profit. Thanks. We had another question, Claire, that you're probably best suited to answer that asks about the level of impact that the foundation is hoping to see from these sorts of grants. Um, do you, and more specifically, do you want, are you interested in a particular level of influence or vision, such as national or state level, or a particular topic of focus? That's a great question. Um, you know, the foundation's vision really is to create a culture of health in the United States, and so that's really a national vision. But the evidence that we need to build has to come from um, national level evidence as well as neighborhood level evidence. So uh, I would say that we need really different levels of investigation and evidence to build the evidence that we need. Um, to move forward through a culture of health. And I would say we would not um, place a priority on a nationally representative sample over a, a, a neighborhood or community or city level sample um, for that reason alone. So yeah, so we wanna, we'd like to see a range of proposals from different levels of communities and regions. Thanks. Nancy, we talked some about wanting to have high impact, actionable studies that focus broadly on public health and specifically on advancing health equity. What about research that focuses more narrowly on specific issues like violence or injury or mental health issues? How would we consider those sorts of proposals? Well, we would, I think, take into consideration several things. One is, is the specific issue one that affects a, a fair number of people so that by addressing that you, we could find overall changes in, in health and well-being. And it may be either that it has a direct effect on a number of people or that it's a model for understanding other problems as well. So, you know, yes, it could be, a, it could be on a specific area, but we would want to know how big the impact would be. Thanks. We got a question, another question about how we, how the program plans to share our findings and collaborate more seamlessly with decision makers. Uh, we do plan on hosting 
an annual convening of our researchers and on facilitating connections between researchers that we fund through this proposal and other work that is ongoing in both the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation portfolio as well as broader beyond and beyond that work at, but related. Um, Claire, do you have any additions around how the Foundation expects to share some of this work more broadly? Sure. Um, the Foundation invests uh, quite significantly in communicating about our findings and evidence. And because the culture of health work is of uh, such fundamental importance to the Foundation's work going forward, we certainly will uh, invest in communicating about our findings. Um, you know, what my communications colleagues tell me is that that will depend on what our findings are. Um, so, you know, I think that we'll see dissemination in the, we definitely would like to see dissemination in the form of peer-reviewed articles um, coming out from you all, our applicants and grantees. Um, and, you know, the foundation will definitely be talking about what we're finding and what we're learning. And it will also inform, you know, future programming and future uh, work of this program as well in future calls for proposals. Uh, so we definitely expect to learn as we go and to continue to disseminate what we're finding um, very broadly. Great. That's really helpful. Laura, talk, can you talk some about our interest in qualitative versus quantitative evidence? Do we have a preference or a priority? Sure. Uh, good question. Um, we are interested in a broad range of methods that will help us answer questions related to the action model. Um, and that includes uh, quantitative and qualitative evidence. Um, qualitative evidence that both can generate new questions but can also answer important questions. So we do not have a bias towards one or the other. Great. And David, kind of building off of this methodology, can you define for people or talk in a little bit more detail about how we would define rigorous when we say that we're looking for rigorous research? I think uh, when we use the word rigorous, it, it is uh, really looking at not just asking the question, but uh, what is the gap that we're trying to fill? So, you know, what do we know about this already? And, uh, you know, how are we going to advance ourselves? And then thinking about the measurement, for example, uh, you know, how tight are, are the measures? Uh, what's the design that's being used? And, uh, you know, how are the data that come from this going to be analyzed? And, again, it's, it's really looking at, um, you know, how tight is uh, the design and uh, methods in order to be able to answer the question that's being posed. Thanks. So we have gotten a, a few more questions around eligibility that I want to address. One of those questions is, do both principal investigators need to be from a 501c3 organization? So no, um, one could be from the government and one could be from a 501c3. And to Claire's point earlier, we even would consider partnerships with, uh, with private organizations. Um, but the primary investigator and the primary grant recipient does need to be eligible based on the criteria we described. Specifically, there was a question about whether or not a city could be the lead researcher. Um, if partnering with the university, and in fact the city or an, a government agency could be a lead researcher even if not partnering with the university, uh, but certainly if you are partnering with the university. So to clarify that particular point, um, universities are not the only eligible applicants and don't need to be the lead for this particular call for proposals. Um, there also were a couple of questions about whether or not you would be eligible to apply for other call for proposals or funding opportunities through the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation if you are a recipient of our award. And uh, yes, you can apply and are eligible to receive funding from other call for proposals through the foundation. Um, 
And then there was a question about whether or not you could receive more than one award through this particular uh, call for proposals. So um, technically that would be possible. However, um, we are looking to have, as we mentioned, a diverse portfolio. And so um, looking to have different perspectives as part of this work. Um, but of course we will consider all proposals and take into consideration um, our funding portfolio at the time. So there's not an explicit um, there's not an explicit clause that would make you ineligible if you received funding, uh, but we we would like to have a broad um, grant grantee base. Nancy, another question, a little bit about eligibility, but you might expand a bit about cross sector or cross discipline discipline proposals and whether or not those would be given a higher priority in our consideration than uh, proposals from one discipline. Sure. Now that's actually really gets I think to the heart of a lot of discussions we've had. Uh, when we say we're, we place a priority, none of these are absolute. They're things we're looking for and hoping to see. So we would certainly hope to see cross-disciplinary and cross-sector collaborations. And actually most of the problems that we're dealing with are complex enough that it's hard to imagine a single discipline could answer it. But if there's a really important question that's within a discipline and, and uh, even within, uh, in, within a sector, uh, it, would, it doesn't mean that would be precluded. But overall we would give priority to more cross-disciplinary and cross-sector approaches. Thanks. So another question that we just received, um, Claire, you may be able to speak to this a little bit, is what differentiates this call for proposals from other proposals funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation? I can give a couple of thoughts but would love for you to build on it. One is, again, that this is rolling, um, not that the foundation doesn't have other rolling proposals, but I think it is a unique aspect, meaning there's not a deadline. Um, and that it's investigator initiated, meaning we're not putting out specific questions for researchers to respond to, but asking researchers to let us know what is the most pressing, timely, interesting questions to answer. But Claire, maybe you have some additional thoughts about how this is a unique proposal for the foundation. Sure, and um, you're exactly right, Erin, with your answers. And the only thing I would add is that substantively, this is really one of our first opportunities to focus our research and evaluation work on the culture of health, and that really the primary purpose of this program is to test and uh, develop evidence around what we're theorizing as a way to achieve a culture of health, which is what we've laid out in the action framework. This program is really meant to test that, those hypotheses that are embedded in the action framework. Um, and that you've been hearing about earlier on in the webinar. So this is unique in its focus on the culture of health and uh, also, as Erin said, rolling its submission deadline, which I think will be helpful for most of you, and also uh, it's investigator initiated. Great, thank you. Um, so Nancy, if you could talk a little bit, people are asking again, are there specific areas, approaches, or health outcomes that we're really most interested in um, in, this, in our call for proposals? You know, there, there really aren't specific ones. We're, we're interested in things certainly that have the biggest impact on population health or the biggest potential impact. Uh, we don't really, we have not specified specific areas or topics. Uh, we're, we're pretty open. Uh, this, is, this is going to be a learning experience, and I should emphasize that this first year uh, is, and what we've said so far is not set in stone. We will be learning from the applications we get and uh, see if where, where we stand and if we either need to be more directive or focused, but really for this first set of applications, we're, we're hoping the investigators will tell us what they think of the important outcomes. Thanks. 
David, we, we've been getting a few questions about randomized control trials or clinical trials and if we would consider those or prioritize those kind of proposals. I, uh, the, answer, the answer on that one uh, comes back to me as let's look at what the possible budget is here and what is feasible in terms of a randomized controlled trial. I think uh, that might be a challenge. doesn't rule it out altogether, but that might be a challenge. Uh, I think the second part is that uh, will it be prioritized over um, other kinds of study designs? I, it, it's not the right question. The right question is, is, is this an important question and is it uh, going to contribute to our overall view of uh, looking at addressing and developing the culture of health. So I think that's the uh, better way to look at this. Thanks. I think that's helpful too. So I've gotten a question to help clarify my comments about this being a rolling application, not, not having a deadline. So someone is asking about when is, but when is the last LOI accepted? And, and the truth is that um, I guess the last LOI would be accepted if we run out of funding, but we mentioned again that this is a three-year program. We may at some point modify our call for proposals. In the first year, we're anticipating $2.2 million of grant funding to go out the door. And so there really isn't a deadline or a, or a date by which we would say we're not accepting letters of intent anymore. And we expect um, that while we work on internal uh, grant timelines, um, that there actually is a, is a flow of um, proposals, that there actually is a flow of when uh, grants will go out the door and when we're able to, um, and when we're able to make those awards and consider letters of intent. I don't know, Nancy, do you want to add a little bit to that? Yeah, in terms of timing, you know, I, we really can't tell you when the right time is to apply. It's, it's when you're ready and have your idea well formulated. We expect that we'll probably get quite a few right at the beginning because there's some pent-up demand. And we're, we're going to try and keep some of our powder dry for applications that may come in later. So we're going to have to do a balancing act of funding terrific proposals but being sure that we leave enough open that we can fund ones that may come in later. So I wouldn't worry. The idea about rolling proposals is we really would like applicants to be able to submit when they're ready. And I, I don't think that you should worry too much about the exact timing. Great. I think that's helpful clarification. David, I have a question for you about learning from international settings. I know you've done quite a bit of international work, and so one of our participants is asking about um, what, what, ki what could we do to learn from international settings, other countries who have a culture of health or might be more advanced than the United States, and how might we think about that in our work? Well, certainly there are examples that uh, have come from other countries, and there's some initiation of some of those ideas and programs and policies uh, from the other countries. And so looking at that in the uh, U.S. context, I think, um, uh, could really, really be exciting to see if it, if it translates uh, to our cultural setting. Great. Nancy, maybe you could talk a little bit about how we would distinguish um, a research program from more of an implementation program or an event. Um, for example, if someone is interested in evaluating the implementation of a program, to what it, how much of the project needs to really be focused on research versus how much can be focused on implementing a new program? Uh, so given, again, that we have limited funds and our, our mandate is to create evidence for action that's generalizable to others. I think we would put less uh, emphasis on funding and implementation and process outcomes and much more if, if 
by evaluating it, it really shows a health outcome and can demonstrate a link that's important. I think it, that would be uh, a high priority. Just the implementation uh, would not be so, so, so high on our agenda. Thanks. Laura, we got a question about our interest in research that might analyze or depict structural determinants of population health, health inequities, and how those, those data could be used routinely by local and state health departments. Um, can you speak at all about what our interest in that sort of research? Sure. Um, you know, I, part of the action model relates to um, bridging, uh, bridging uh, data systems um, across multiple sectors and information on structural determinants of health um, that might be collected in other sectors um, and how it could be used by local and state health departments is certainly uh, in, the, in the running. I mean, I think that that talks um, directly to this question of how you bridge or, and share data. Um, some of that might actually be collected by the local or state health departments themselves, and then it's um, a question really related to action area four, which is uh, really thinking about health, how health services and health systems, including public health systems, um, can, can uh, think about new roles for themselves in, um, in building a culture of health. So uh, I, I don't know if that answers this person's question, but I think uh, uh, yes, the answer is yes, we are interested in how public health departments, local and state, and uh, even more you know, at the federal level um, would integrate st structural determinants, um, data collection, and um, action around those structural de determinants. Thanks, Laura. I do think that that is helpful. Uh, Nancy, I'm going to give you the last question before we probably need to sign off. And uh, Claire, if you want to add to this from the Foundation's perspective, please feel free. The question is, if the goal is to have actionable research, then how will the data, how will the research and evidence um, be used to raise public awareness and mobilize action? Well, we're ending with probably the $64,000 question. Uh, you know, that's partly, that's part of what we actually would hope to hear from our applicants is how they will plan to use the information to do this. We're all learning how best to do it. And uh, we also hope that by having the kind of critical mass within the program and using the kinds of things you described earlier with a, an annual meeting and trying to make those linkages, we can hopefully magnify the effects of the knowledge to do that. Claire, would you like to add anything to that? Thanks, Nancy. Um, I agree with what you said, and I'll just reiterate a little bit that, you know, the context of this program is really to unearth the evidence. And um, some of our tests will find um, really successful interventions and some won't. And it's import, equally important to make both of those sets of findings really clear. And that's um, uh, very much in the Foundation's interest and goal to do that and to spread that knowledge across our partners who are working to build a culture of health. So uh, I expect, again, that our individual grantees will be focused primarily on local communication of their results and peer-reviewed journal articles, and that it's the Foundation with our communications colleagues and our programming partners that will develop um, uh, messages and uh, spread our learning very broadly across our partnerships. So it's a, it's a very important goal for the foundation. And uh, we're really depending on, on you all, um, our applicants and grantees, to help unearth these um, pieces of evidence that we'll need to spread. Thanks so much. I do think that was a great place to end our discussion. I know we're out of time, but I want to make sure to share our contact information with you. So please visit our website, connect with us through LinkedIn, and follow us on Twitter. You can also reach out via email or phone if you have specific questions that we weren't able to answer today, and opt into our listserv that will allow you to stay up to date with program information. Again, this, pre this presentation will be archived on our website in the next few days. 
and thank you so much for joining us today.